So um, I will try to make this a little bit interactive. So are you still awake? Raise your hand. Awesome. Wow. Thank you. Um, so the title of my talk is How Modeling and Simulation Can Optimize a Clinical Trial. And we've already talked a lot about uh, how trials are evolving from simply seeing whether in a phase one you have safety issues to a phase one where you look at all of these extra data. And now we're even moving towards adaptive trial designs and model-based trials. And I'd like to show you a very simple example of such a model-based trial design. By the way, um, who is moving towards model-based trial designs? That's honestly what I expected. But we see that even the FDA is expecting us to move towards model-based uh, design. So in the goals uh, for scientific development from 2018 to 2022, we see that they want to facilitate the development and application of exposure-based biological and statistical models. And they want to facilitate the advancement of complex, adaptive, and other novel clinical trial designs. What actually are they saying? Well, they're saying that we should use the knowledge that we've gathered in preclinical, both in vitro and in vivo. We should make a model of that knowledge. We should try and describe this through mathematical equations. And then based on that, we should make better decisions when we move to a first-in-man or even uh, in other clinical trial designs. And what I want you to do, I want, what I want to do now is give an example of such a novel clinical trial design. So just as a reminder, why actually are we doing clinical trials? Is it to have a good primary endpoint? Is it to prove that there's no safety issues? Well, yes, it's all of that. But actually, the most important thing, and that's what uh, Adrian uh, said so beautifully, is to have data. We need data so that in all of these subsequent trials, we make the right decision. And once we go to market, we make the right decision for the patients. And that's actually why a phase one is so crucial. What I've shown just below is how our modeling uh, accompanies this process. So from discovery of a, of a molecule and preclinical, we basically only have the science to guide us. We know how big the molecule is. We know how fast it goes through the bloodstream, uh, what effect it might have on lungs, kidneys, stomachs, etc. But this is all theoretical. And even in animal data, we can only more or less confirm what we know, but we never know what happens in patients. And a phase one is on that crucial step where we, go, we, will, where we will test all of this, th this theoretical knowledge in humans. So, let's now move and focus on phase one. So, how can modeling and simulation help? Well, it will help you to answer the three big questions when you want to design a phase one trial. And the first question is to define the first dose. Where are you going to start? What is the first or lowest non-effective dose? It will help you to define how you will escalate and how fast you might escalate. And then finally, it will define when you will stop, which is important because if you have a very well-tolerated compound, you might never stop. Or you might stop at a dose that is too low to finally have efficacy in patients. So it's something important. And typically, previously, let's say 10 years ago, these questions were answered by doing some statistics, by translating uh, in a, let's say, just upscaling from uh, animal data. The example I'm going to show clearly shows that this is not always possible. So let's now go through this journey that we actually did uh, for a client. Well, first thing, we got animal data. And I want to zoom in directly on the first graph. What we see here is actually very nice. We've administered the compound, which is a monoclonal antibody. And through time, we can see that after several administrations, we have a very nice, just linear elimination. 
You can even, just by eyeballing it, see that the half-life is, let's say, about 700 hours. So great. Well, not so great, because afterwards we received this data. And you can see the data from the previous slide here in red. And when we gave a higher dose to the mouse population, suddenly you get this very weird curve. So in the beginning, you have the same clearance as previously, and then suddenly you get this effect that the clearance becomes much slower until you go to these lower concentrations where, again, you seem to have a, 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 a higher clearance again. So what actually is happening here? Well, what is happening is target-mediated drug disposition. Who knows this term? Cool. Well, everybody who's working with monoclonal antibodies, I think, we, I hope to uh, learn you something. So what happens in the body? Uh, you have a target, a protein that acts in some system. This protein degrades over time and is replenished by the body. So, very simple, you maintain a steady rate. Now, what happens if we add our compound? Well, our compound will be eliminated again at a steady rate, right? So, this is what we'd expected to see, and this is what, uh, what, uh, why I was so pleased with the first graph. But now, we know in reality that actually, when we add our compounds, it will bind with our protein in the body, which is actually what we want to do, because that's the effect of our compound, that's why we, why we developed it in the first place. So, what will happen is that immediately a complex is formed. And how much complex is formed, of course, depends on the binding rate constant. Uh, who remembers reversible molecule binding from chemistry? Yeah, awesome. Um, and now you can see that there's el an elimination, both from the complex and from the single molecule. And now after one hour, if I just count, I have only two molecules of my compound available anymore. And actually, the one I can measure is only the one on the, on the left. So, in graphs, what we see is that typically we have a, a fixed target concentration. And if we give our monoclonal antibody without any interaction, then it's just eliminated in a, a logarithmic way, in an exponential way. Um, now, if we have this target-mediated drug disposition, if our monoclonal antibody binds to the target, then what you will see is that immediately there's a bunch of our compound that disappears over here. This goes into the complex, and you will see that the elimination rate is much faster because it's eliminated through two different ways. So far, so good, I think. Now, Let's try and explain that very weird graph that we saw afterwards. So, what happens if we now give a lot of compounds, a very high dose? Well, again, a part of this will bind with our target, but not everything. We will eliminate a part, and then suddenly, we see that there's no more that is actually going to that right route. There's no complex that is formed because all of the target is depleted. The body can't create the target fast enough for that elimination route on the right to happen. So that's why after a very short while, the compound is only eliminated through the compound itself and not through this complex until the concentration is low enough, and then you can again eliminate through both routes. Okay, great. We have a theory. We can uh, create mathematical equations. We can fit all of the animal data through it. Great. We have an explanation. We can translate this to human. Now, not exactly. There's a big issue here. And the issue is that we don't know whether we're in the low-dose case or in the high-dose case. Either the dose we want to give to human 
is so small that it's almost directly, completely bound to that target, and it disappears in an instant, which is... Two, two, two. Can I... <laughs> yeah, fine. Just go to, this, to the screen. This is more interactive anyway. Um, so uh, you have a lot of target. It's immediately eliminated. Or you have so little target that actually you're going to observe an almost linear PK. And the big issue was we, don't, we simply don't know, which is a big issue if you want to plan a phase one. Because you have no idea how your PK concentration will behave. So actually what we did is we said, well, let's do a complex adaptive design. Let's first test a very low dose in a first cohort. This low dose is non-efficacious, we know this, but at least it will help us to know whether our PK is linear or whether it's completely absorbed through our target. And actually what we saw is something nicely in the middle which is often the case with biology. So, this is great. Now we at least have a lot more confidence in predicting the next dose. If I want to remind you, predicting the next dose with a model like this, you can't do it. So again, um, there were still some doubts. Uh, why? Because this target-mediated drug disposition can either be governed by the binding rate constant, where you might have a lot of target, but the molecule just doesn't have affinity, or because the body very slowly produces target. So we used both assumptions to create predictions of those. And based on these assumptions, the clinical team could pick a dose, pick the next dose for the next cohort, with a lot more confidence than they had from the animal models where was, well, not exactly like this, but almost. So here, they immediately moved from a 0 0.01 mix per kilo dose to a 0 0.05, tested this. Again, we had very nice results. Ironically, again, right in the middle of our two estimations. And now we had a model that very nicely predicted what was going on in PK. And not only in PK, but also in PD. So if I move to PD, then you can see here that we can very nicely also predict how much target will be free, free to do whatever function in the body it was supposed to do, and how much is bound by the complex. And we can very nicely see that, okay, for a 0 0.01 milligram per kilo dose, uh, you will inhibit the system for, let's say, pff, one day, but for this high, high dose, half a milligram per kilo, you inhibit the system for, let's say, 40 days. And of course, this allows you to plan your next cohort in a much better way. You already know how long you will need to observe this patient. You already know how long there will be a risk for this patient. And by the way, you even see a, a dose-effect relationship from these graphs. So that's all things, that's all information that you can use during the planning of your phase one study. Great. So as a final step, bridging to patients, you can already predict, okay, what will be the regimen that we're going to give patients? We want to inhibit the system continuously. So what is the steady state concentration that we will need? Hence, what is the dose that we will need? And based on this, we could also say, okay, with this dose, we inhibit the system completely. Let's stop here. Let's not test a higher dose because honestly, keeping a patient in-house for uh, 100 days is almost ridiculous. So, let's review. What actually did we do? Well, we translated the animal data that we had, which was a bit strange at first, to human, and we concluded there's no way we can even begin to think about a fixed phase one trial. So what we did is say, okay, let's do a first cohort 
look at the data, refine the model, and use the model to define the next dose. And then finally, for the stopping rules, instead of just keeping escalating until we see adverse events or even serious adverse events, we can very nicely already simulate what dose we would need in patient population and stop when we reach that dose. So, to conclude, if you do a integrated PKPD modeling, then during the study you can already make informed decisions. You can already make decisions based on your first cohort and that's immensely valuable. That can stop too high doses from occurring that can, and that can also stop you from doing the inverse stopping your phase one study before you've reached an efficacious dose in patients. Now, of course, I think the main argument against this is that it's difficult to do. You can't just stop your first cohort and say, well, now we're going to send this data to uh, SGS PKPD modeling group and wait two months. So you have to organize this operationally. And we have the experience to do this. Um, by the way, you can see from uh, the graphs that a lot of the data was only interim data from the first cohort, for example, two or three days before the next cohort would start. Um, and this shows that we are able to do this without a severe impact on the timing of a phase one. And then finally, um, this is just one example, um, but I can think of plenty of other examples and I would love to talk to you after this session of um, cases where modeling and simulation has a real value and the nice thing is that if you use an experienced group you can just use all of that knowledge and immediately include it in your submission dossier. Thank you very much. So please reach out.